welcome to the Native Informed podcast. We are back. Me too, off screen as usual. I'm so sorry, but... Hello. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is going to be a continuation of what we discussed the last time around, which was very successful about womanhood. We are now going into boyhood or manhood, so to speak. So the conversations are going to be surrounding that topic. And hopefully, hopefully it will be successful as the last one. So let's get into it. What are the questions? So you wrote down a couple of things. And the first one was, in quotes, boys will always be boys. I've been reading this book recently that talks about raising men in the age of toxic masculinity or raising boys in the age of toxic masculinity. And the findings are just absolutely wild. They talk about how boys in general tend to develop their sort of the neurological receptors in their brain that deal with emotional self-regulation and with impulse control. And they develop it much later than girls do. What's interesting with the findings is that it shows that boys don't get enough care from their caregivers, especially their mothers when they're raised. It's almost like, oh, we'll just kind of leave it up to society to deal with it. Boys will be boys. They're a bit more erratic in their behavior. They're so rambunctious in the way that they deal with things. So, you know, we'll just let them be without actually taking into consideration that boys need a lot of tender love and care. And within that same book, it talks about how boys are actually a lot more sensitive than girls, almost by every measure. It talks about emotional fragility. It talks about vulnerability. It talks about, as I said, the ability to self-regulate. It's wild to me to think that the idea that boys will be boys is just simply a term that we can throw around and they can be taught to be better. They can be taught to learn things better. They can be taught to communicate better. It's actually, I mean, probably get counseled for it, but it is, it is the fault of the parents and it is the fault of society. I think that trying to raise boys in this age of like demonizing and villainizing men, saying that boys will be boys is just an excuse or society's excuse to justify their inability to listen, to understand, and to validate the experience of boyhood. Um, so do you think it has more to do with the nurture rather than the nature? Absolutely. If the women have been socialized, as well as men, and I mean that by mothers and fathers, to allow boys to be boys or allow boys to act as the way that they want to act, and it creates like a social, emotional, and psychological fracture in that boy's upbringing. It, it really causes them to not understand the way that they need to deal with people, to socialize with people, to regulate their emotions, to, you know, course correct on their impulse controls. And I think, you know, what's crazy with the findings that I found also with, with the book that I'm reading, research done by Dr. James W. Prescott, and he kind of did a study on boys and girls, generally speaking. He was touching on sort of the measurements of teenage attitudes towards like emotional immaturity. Part of that research was talking about how in the West, when they deal with communication with boys and girls it's very very different so with girls they'll communicate emotionally and with boys they'll communicate competitively so they'll say things like for, you know for girls like oh your feelings are valid and everything that you say is warranted and we're here to understand you and don't give in to the shame etc etc and with boys it's more like you know you got to show them what you're made of you know fight the fury and like don't take no for an answer and these are the kind of languages that they're giving to boys and girls in the west but in South Asian culture and studies majority from India, I mean, I'm sure in the Middle East and whatnot, is that it's the reverse. They use competitive language with girls and emotional language with boys. So examples of that would be like, you're carrying on the family name. You are the pride and joy of the family. Like you can do no wrong in our eyes. It's emotional coddling and emotional cushioning of their feelings. And with girls, it's like, you better make sure that you look good when you go to somebody's house. You gotta find yourself a good husband. Don't embarrass me in front of everyone. And it's got this competitive mindset. And it's just fascinating to find out that in the West, emotional conversations for girls, competitive conversation for boys. In the Middle East, South Asian, all of that jazz, emotional languages with boys and competitive languages with girls. That, that, that is actually pretty accurate. So one thing I want to touch back on, you said it's about trying to make, trying to teach them to be better now. It's a lot difficult. <laughs> it's a lot difficult because Look, the last thing that you said kind of really hit home. It does. It really does hit home because to be honest, that's true. And when you say things to boys when you're growing up that, yeah, you're the pride and joy of our house and that- You carry so, on our legacy, it's all of that. That coddling that goes yeah. on, that gives them, I think like it, A, it puts a lot of pressure. Yeah. And B, it gives them like this sense of like, yeah, since I am, I can do anything. 
But you know what's really funny about the study is that they examined those ideas that, uh -huh. you know, this is a type of information that's being received in the West versus in the Middle East, in North Africa, in South mm -hmm. Asia, all of that. But what was funny is that they said, okay, well, if by measure you're giving more emotions to boys because that's what it should be, and then maybe take away a little bit from the from the girls by being more competitive, then surely it should yield the results where men will be more emotionally stable. They would be able to regulate their emotions. They would be able to have impulse control that is beyond the measures of what the West has assigned for them in these other parts of the world. But that's not the result. They found that the boys ended up even more immature than what it was like in the West. And that's because one of the main factors that they didn't take into account was gender bias. And that is the idea that women in our part of the world actually experience more postpartum depression with girls than we do with boys. It's this idea they're like, oh, you didn't get a son. How are you gonna carry on the family lineage? Mm -hmm. How are you worthy as a woman if you do not bore a son? With that, it plays a profound effect on the emotional impact of these boys. Like they grow up feeling like, yeah, I'm the bee's knees, everyone loves me, but I have nothing to say for it, I have nothing to show for it. They also don't take into account privilege and how privilege plays a role in these kind of sociocultural contexts. So I think it's like when we discuss this idea of like, boys will be boys, or there's a stereotype of, of men, you know, being bashed by society, it is all true, but it can go either way. It's like a spectrum. On one extreme, you can be so divorced and so detached from the upbringing of your child because you're like, he's a guy, he'll figure it out. He'll grow up to be a man, he'll learn the hard way. Or it's like over coddling, subliminally training the child to believe that they are greater without having achieved anything. Mm. That is, I think, one of the biggest cause for the results of these types of surveys that they've been creating. So it's not so much generational trauma, it's generational conditioning. Absolutely. Generational conditioning over generational trauma is absolutely a factor that plays into the way that boys and girls are raised, for sure. And I think that when you are raised in an environment where you're taught that by way of reproduction, you are benefiting the family if you have a boy versus having a girl because they get to carry on the patrilineal legacy and the girl doesn't, you are actively and passively teaching that child that you've already won. Mm -hmm. You've already won. As a boy, you've already won. And that's, I think, one of the biggest lies that we have manifested in West Asian, North African and South Asian cultures, mm -hmm. and maybe even African cultures as well, that like, this gender bias has had a profound negative effect. And so this kind of brings up the conversation of like, does the patriarchy exist? It's like, you have to figure out, does the patriarchy exist? It absolutely does. But which context are you talking about? The West or uh, other parts of the world? Mm -hmm. In the West, it's like mostly to do with the gender pay gap and all of these different things. But in West Asian, Middle Eastern, South Asian, whatever cultures, it is profoundly entrenched in these cultural nuances that have to come from survival, that have to come from these patrilineal legacies. A lot of people are gonna be super sensitive about what you just said, mm -hmm. right? As usual. As usual, because yes, my parents told me as a, as a boy, as a man, that you ha I am the pride and joy and that mm -hmm. I have to carry all of these things. But then obviously people are gonna be like, yeah, I, I'm aware of that, but the pressure and the things that come with it and it's not always the same and maybe I'm not a jerk. This is the thing, when you talk about postpartum depression in women. In the West, 80% of women have postpartum depression when they have a boy. 80% of women in our parts of the world have depression when they have a girl. What does that tell you? It tells you that there is a massive gender bias against girls being born rather than boys in our part of the world. Since pre-birth, you're already causing these, we can even make them like cultural microaggressions mm. or like gendered microaggressions against the children that you have. So yes, we can make that argument. As you said, people will get upset about that. They'll be like, well, then what's the case? It's like, you're damned if you do, or you're damned if you don't. But I think the most important thing is that there is a fundamental difference between nurturing your child to be able to communicate and to self-regulate their emotions versus over coddling them and not providing them with the resources and tools that they need to build their own character. And I think that's the, that's the sort of sweet spot that we're talking about when it comes to, for example, a boy becoming a man. He has to, yes, learn the hard way sometimes, but that villainizing the child, being like, you're not supposed to cry, don't cry like a girl, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, it's gonna have a negative, uh, like a negative impact on this child. I think it's a fine balance and it hasn't really been done in a way where they take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Data doesn't lie. so. Yes, these boys are growing up with a silver spoon in their mouths, whether it has to do with cultural silver spoon feeding or, 
you know, emotional silver spoon feeding, but there is there is a withholding of emotion when it comes to the way that they raise boys, which is why when they grow up to be men, they're like, you know, having such a hard time figuring out their emotions. And I think like you could even bring it to like boys and dating or boys and ghosting, because mm. I was talking about this and I've and I've said this before, but when I interviewed Dr. Vincent Hanorem and he was talking about the intersexual dynamics in dating, he was saying in the research, when it comes to things like ghosting or when it comes to men dating multiple women at the same time, men actually do not know how to deal with rejection. That is why they ghost. That is why they do not have the ability to date one person and to put all of their eggs in one basket because they would rather do everything else than be rejected. They put on this front where they're not allowing to register what their emotions are in their bodies and where they sit. Mm. And they're like, oh, I'll just avoid, 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 dismiss, dismiss, dismiss. And the way they do is like, I don't wanna talk about it or it's just not a big deal, I don't care, I'll get over it. I'll, you know, work out at the gym and hope that that's gonna like, you know. Not necessarily ghosting the woman, it's just you're not accounting your own feelings. You're not giving them any kind of weight. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole point. It's not, when we say ghosting in men, it's not just necessarily ghosting another woman. It's just the lack or the inability to face your own emotions. Yeah. Or understand your emo own emotions. And I think that kind of plays into how they were raised, where yep. they weren't allowed to, like, you know, delve into their emotions or they were just told that, okay, fine, you'll figure it out. It's this constant beating down on men that is very problematic in society, where just by sheer association of being a man, you're considered the beacon of toxic masculinity, the archetype for all the things that are disgusting in manhood, the apologists for all the people that don't know how to treat women properly, and you are vilified for everything that you do. So the same way that girls are being treated in certain ways by society, boys are also treated that same way too. And I think when we can start to pull back from that and try and create safe spaces for men to communicate and to be heard and to be listened to and to be validated. I remember even like chatting with my brother about this and he was just like, you know, in the age of like the Me Too movement and things like that, like people automatically assume that you're a bad guy just by existing as a man. You've done nothing wrong, but all of a sudden you have to apologize for all the bad behavior that men have done when you probably have never done anything like that, but you're automatically villainized. You're automatically painted out to be the aggressor. Mm -hmm. How does that even make sense? I think it's it's a double-edged sword. There's going to be people that really do have problems with dealing with their toxic masculinity and they've never had a chance to to, to regulate that in some way and, and, mm -hmm. and learn to be better and to do better. But there are also men out there that are really decent human beings that are getting the short end of the stick just by simply existing as a man. The gender bias within our parts of the world, mm -hmm. it is very, very real. And, and that's why I always get really frustrated whenever I speak to people about the patriarchal belief system or patriarchy in general. They're always like, yes, but this is like the Western view of patriarchy. I'm like, come to our side of the world. That's where the real patriarchy exists. Mm -hmm. It's not in the nuances of the gender pay gap. It's not in the nuances of equality amongst person in a professional field. Mm -hmm. It is the cultural ancestral legacies that are entrenched in this idea of building up boys and putting down girls. And that is something that the data supports. So people can say like, not all men and not all women. Yes, not all men and not all women, but data doesn't lie. So look at the data. There is a fundamental reason why you hear conversations in living rooms anecdotally where you're amongst all of these aunties and, and cousins where they're like, oh, have you had a boy yet? Why haven't you had a boy? Mm. Like who's gonna carry on the family name? There are certain things that make sense, but there are other things that just simply don't. And I think when you are a boy coddled for such a long period of time and you're raised in an environment where you don't have to justify yourself to anyone ever, like you leave the house at, 13 years old, you go out and your sister who's much older than you has to come back at 8 p.m. but you can go out and stay as long as you want and you really don't have to justify it. You grow up feeling like, hmm, not only do I have to not justify myself to anyone or anything, I never have to be accountable because mama said so. And not only that, even if I do have emotions, I'm gonna bottle them up deep down inside and never talk about them ever, ever again, because that's what society did. They didn't allow me to speak about my feelings, so I'm not going to. It's like the blind leading the deaf. There's never a solution, you know? I don't know. I feel like I'm like repeating myself over and over again, but, but it is. does that then raise weak men? Because let's say just for argument's sake, anytime the child is getting upset about something, you tell them to dismiss their emotions, invalidate their feelings, ignore the way that they are, not help them regulate their emotions. 
not help them navigate how they feel. What ends up happening is that they bury everything down, deep down into the very inner core of their being, and then it comes out in other ways, like they'll get into fights, they'll start letting out their anger and their rage. Every action has a reaction. Every cause has an effect. Just because if you hear a boy out and you listen to their emotions, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden they're gonna end up being these weak men that don't know how to understand I think that quite the opposite. They'll understand their emotions so well that they'll be able to have healthy relationships with people. They'll be able to make connections with people. But the people that I've found in, in you know, my life, whether they're friends or family or colleagues or whatever, the people that I cannot have decent conversations with or I can't find a middle ground where we can understand each other are people that don't know how to understand their own emotions, don't know how to regulate their own emotions and use other things as coping mechanisms to justify their really horrendous behavior. I think it's really, really hard. I wouldn't understand, I'm not a parent, so I don't know, but I think it is really hard to raise children. But I think putting children down from a young age where they are supposed to be one way or another without letting them understand who they are as people and where their emotions come from, I think is the biggest mistake. And let's say there are these men that are becoming more self-aware of the fact that, okay, fine, you know what, the way that I was raised and the kind of ideologies that I had growing up are essentially wrong or they're essentially faulty and I want to change. I think there's multiple different answers that you can give, but I think fundamentally is to not shy away from your emotions. You have to sit in them. And I mm -hmm. think that men do an excellent job of avoiding, mm -hmm. like avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. And the way that they do that is they're like, I'll go to the gym and I'll be better, or I'll go out for a, you know, for a drink, drown my sorrows away, mm -hmm. and find ways to emotionally detach from the actual feeling at hand. It's hard for them not only to recognize the emotion that they're in, but leading up to that emotion and then having that emotion leave. Mm -hmm. Because they don't, th there's no beginning, middle and end. and I think that's very problematic. And I saw a quote recently, which I thought was really funny. It was saying something like, oh, you know, men should actually go to therapy rather than going to the gym. Like instead of hitting the gym, they should hit therapy. I think therapy is, you know, great for some people. It's mm -hmm. not for others. What I can say about therapy is that it provides you the tools and the necessities that you need in order to navigate and course correct your emotions. If you have the framework from which you can depart from and understanding your emotions, that's all you can take away from therapy. If you don't wanna sit there and like, you know, word vomit all of your feelings, fine. But at least take those skills and those tools that you need to navigate said emotion. And I think that's the one step for them to heal. The second step is I do believe that a lot of the responsibility falls on other men to course correct men mm -hmm. whenever they do uh, horrendous behavior. They need to course correct. And also women have to course correct men. But I don't think that men should be vilified in the process of course correction. Like let's try and approach this in a really healthy and constructive way mm -hmm. so that it can be more like solution orientation rather than coming with more and more problems. Mm -hmm. And I find that like, whenever my friends are kind of like dealing with their, their partners, they're always like, he should have known this and he didn't this and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, 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 that's all valid. But maybe he didn't know. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought that, that he might not actually know? Have you ever thought that he might not actually be in a position to have understood that when situations occur or when an argument arises that he should sit in his emotions and have a conversation with you, that not to run away? And if he is running away, why is he running away? Have you ever thought about that? And I'm not saying that this means that all of the burden has to rest on the shoulders of all the other men and women while the, the man in question reaping all the benefits that people have to offer. No, I think everyone has a role to play, but that's when the community comes in. And that's when collectivism is so important and not individualism. Like you don't have to go at it on your own. There is a community that can build around you that can support you. Unfortunately, in a lot of cultures, whether it's our cultures, it doesn't create that space to allow for these men to have these conversations the same way it doesn't really create for women to have those conversations either. Yeah, there's so many different answers to it, but I feel like we could talk around in circles when it comes mm -hmm. to this topic, but um, I mean, look, we're just trying it. Like, I think people should just recommend questions for us to, to answer and hopefully that will be in the next podcast. I think podcast. in the next video we'll talk about um, adulthood and dating. Yeah, I think that's what people <laughs> like, like the, the Ooh, juice of it. The juice, the tea. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I, I think we said what we could say on that subject. And hopefully in the next podcast, we'll be able to kind of clear it up. But for those of you who are listening, please like, subscribe, hit the no notification bell. And yeah, I guess we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.